Hey everybody, welcome back to our continuing coverage of the 158th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, we're actually not standing in Gettysburg for this, this video. We're actually starting to make our way outside towards the west of Gettysburg. We're actually near Fairfield, Pennsylvania, which is about 12 miles, oh, just about southwest of, of uh, Gettysburg as we head towards Monterey Pass and eventually down towards the Mason-Dixon line as we start to follow the line of retreat for uh, Robert E. Lee's army away from the Gettysburg battlefield. But before we do that, there are actually actions that took place out here in Fairfield. Specifically, the one we're going to talk about is with Dr. Carol Reardon, who is a fantastic historian, author, professor, uh, Gettysburg Foundation board, uh, board member. She is fantastic, and we're going to talk a little bit about the action that took place out here on July 3rd between Grumble Jones uh, and his brigade of uh, Confederate horsemen and the 6th uh, United States Cav. Uh, which were part of John Buford's division, Wesley Merritt's brigade, John Buford's division. So a lot of people think of John Buford's division after July 1st, kind of disappearing. They'll make their way down towards the Peach Orchard for a while. Then they'll make their way down to Thurmont, uh, which is today Thurmont, Maryland. And then eventually they'll start getting back into the campaign, specifically uh, with Wesley Merritt's brigade. And then we'll start to see some more action with them as we get closer to Williamsport. But Carol, why are we going to be out here in Fairfield? What is uh, Grumble Jones, one of the angriest guys in the Confederate <laughs> Army, taking on who seems to be one of the angriest guys in the Union Army, a guy named Samuel Starr. What are these two curmudgeons doing out here in Fairfield? Well, hi, everybody. This, since we are now in curmudgeon fest, apparently, let me, tell you two, let me tell you a little bit about these rival commanders. Grumble Jones, officially William Edmondson Jones, is a West Point graduate, class of 1848, about 12th in his class. When he graduated, he went into the 1st U.S. Dragoons. Uh, he had a fairly successful pre-war career. He was considered to be one of the best outpost officers in the entire United States Army until he resigned in 1857. He got his nickname Grumble because he was a bit of a martinet. He was really harsh on discipline and he had a fairly soured disposition. Uh, shortly after he graduated from West Point, he got married. And in a very tragic accident, his wife was actually swept out of his arms on, in a, during a storm. Uh, they were on a boat and she was swept away from him and he never recovered from that really. And he's, he brought a lot of his energy into uh, his military life and into making things as orderly as he could possibly manage them so he had some control over things. Right now, his brigade, the old Laurel Brigade that was became famous under Turner Ashby, is has just returned to get has just arrived at Gettysburg. Uh, General Lee had had Grumble Jones's brigade protecting the mountain gaps as the army moved north and maintained security on them while the uh, Lee's army was here in Pennsylvania. And now they have come here to Pennsylvania and come here to Gettysburg, and Lee has new orders for Jones. Whenever we talk about Meade and his fish hook, we always talk about how important it is for him to con maintain control of two roads, the Baltimore Pike and the Tawny Town Road. Well, Robert E. Lee has two roads he has to hold on to as well, the Cash Town Road or Chambersburg Pike and the Fairfield Road. If he has to pull back, he needs those roads and the mountain gaps that they go through in order to get his army back to Virginia safely. The Cash Town Road or Chambersburg Pike is under control. The Fairfield Road, not so much. And the Fairfield Road, we're about to have some uh, rural traffic around here. <laughs> we're just warning you in advance that uh, we'll have a little bit of, of noise here. In fact, I think I'm going to pause for just a few seconds here until this big vehicle passes us. <laughs> Yeah. One of the things we learn while doing these is that you have to work with what you got. <laughs> and sometimes we get interesting vehicles. Anyway, what Robert E. Lee's orders are to Grumble Jones this day is to make sure to secure the Fairfield Gap and the Fairfield Road just in case, uh, just in case Lee is going to need them, and he will. So basically, Grumble Jones is coming down this road. The road we see here today is called the Carroll's Tract Road. Named for our speaker. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Only spelled wrong. But then, uh, back then, it was the Ort Ortana-Cashtown Road. Ortana and Cashtown, 
two roads up this way. It will go right into the main road into Fairfield. And so this is a key road to hold on to. So that's sort of what Grumble Jones is doing this day. Now let's flash over to Wesley Merritt's camp. Late in the morning on July 3rd, uh, an older man comes into camp and purports that he is a farmer who lives here in Fairfield and that there are an awful lot of Confederate wagons that were parked on his property and lightly guarded. And why don't you come and grab them? They're there for the taking. Well, if you're Wesley Merritt, newly promoted, and looking for a way to make your name, this is a rather intriguing prospect for you. There is some inherent risk. Fairfield is behind Confederate lines, but cavalry is very mobile, and if they're lightly guarded and he can make a dash in here and capture something, well, you know, this might be a good start to his brigade command. He's going to get orders to move his brigade up toward Gettysburg. We know that most of Merritt's brigade will be involved in the fighting on the South Cavalry Field. But he'll take one regiment, the 6th United States Cavalry, and he will send them here to Fairfield to come after the wagons. The commander, that other curmudgeon, is Major Samuel Starr. Samuel Starr had enlisted in the United States Army back in 1832. He's over 50 years old. He is still real ready to go out here and mix it up with anybody who wants to give him a hard time. Uh, he temporarily accepted a promotion to colonel and became the uh, commanding officer of a New Jersey infantry regiment. But he, had, he was very seriously into uh, proper discipline too. And when he gave orders too brusquely to civilian volunteers, let's just say they didn't like him very much. And one day when he happened to pull his sword and whack one of his soldiers on the uh, on the back or the behind with the flat of his sword. Well, that just crossed the line for a whole lot of his soldiers and they demanded that he resign. Well, he did and he came back and accepted a demotion and came back to the 6th uh, United States Cavalry. For a while, a brief while, he seemed to have found his niche because as a senior officer present in uh, the regular brigade, the reserve brigade of Buford's division, as a major, he was acting brigade commander. But a couple days before the battle, this young whippersnapper of a Brigadier General, Wesley Merritt, shows up. And now this older gentleman with all this experience is sent back to Brigade Command. He's looking for an opportunity to excel as well. So when he gets the orders to come to Fairfield and disrupt and destroy and do whatever he can to make the, life of the lives of the Confederates more difficult, he embraces it with enthusiasm. Curmudgeonly enthusiasm, <laughs> but enthusiasm just the same. When they arrive in Fairfield, they come in from the south, and basically, Starr doesn't know where, any, where the Confederates are, and he finds the residents of Fairfield very unwilling to come forward with information. He will send some of his troops off west of town. He will scatter little patrols down various roads, and one of those patrols under Lieutenant Christian Balder will come right down this road, and somewhere in this general area, he will spot wagons. Not the hundreds of wagons that the old farmer had said, maybe only about eight, but they were lightly guarded. And Balder is going to push forward. The wagon guards are going to push back. There's a little bit of a fight. And all of a sudden, Balder notices that coming right down this road happens to be at the right place at the right time, the head of Grumble Jones's column. Well, if you're Balder and you have a little bit of smarts to you, you say, I'm out of here. And he's going to take his men back to the main road in Fairfield. And he's going to tell Major Starr, that there are wagons out here and there's a lot of Confederates out here. Now, Major Starr has two choices. Discretion better be being the better part of valor. I'm gonna go and rejoin the rest of Merritt's Brigade and just get out of here and re report Confederates and strength back here. Or I can go and fight. Starr is going to op opt to fight and he's gonna bring his troops forward. And if you can see behind me, and I think Gary will lift this up a little bit, you can see a little piece of high ground right down the road. Okay, Gary's pointing it out for you. And right about on that little ridge right there, Starr is gonna take his forces. He has about 350 men with him. And he's going to leave about half of them mounted in sort of in the center of his line, basically right near the road here. And he's gonna deploy uh, the rest of them dismounted. The ones who are on your right, are on the west side of the road, are have the protection of an orchard. The ones who are on the eastern side are mostly out in wheat fields and in um, grass fields. But it's a long line that straddles the road. Well, coming down the road, basically the way you're, you're looking 
comes the lead element of Grumble Jones's brigade. It's the 7th Virginia Cavalry. That ends up being Grumble Jones's own old command. And he basically sees Star's men stretched out here in front of the Marshall House that you can see, or behind the Marshall House that you can see ahead of you, and says, charge. And so just imagine the 7th Virginia coming down this road. The road is probably only about half as wide as what you see now. And to compound matters, there was a strong post and rail fence on both sides. Basically, the cavalry was just being funneled down the road. Well, the Union forces are lined up in an ideal way in order to make the 7th Virginia Cavalry's life very difficult, and for some, very short. Uh, not only do you have the fire of the mounted troopers coming straight at you, but you have converging fire from the dismounted troopers coming in on you. And the head of the 7th Virginia column, they got smacked. At least two lieutenants and perhaps four or five cavalrymen uh, just fell dead or mortally wounded. Another 20 so wounded. Imagine the chaos of wounded horses, screaming men, all that uh, utter chaos happening right in the middle of the road here. The 7th Virginia Cavalry is going to pull back. And nobody is more livid about all this than Grumble Jones. He's not grumbling, he's screaming. He said, this is a blemish on your record. The bright record of the bright history of this regiment has been besmirched by your behavior here. And he is not gonna tolerate it one bit. He's going to call up a battery of horse artil artillery, Captain Robert Preston Chu's uh, Ashby Horse Artillery from Virginia. And he's gonna deploy them in the field right here in front of us. And he's going to aim at uh, Major Starr's position, at least four, if not five guns. He's also going to order the next regiment in line, the 6th Virginia Cavalry, to dismount, to spread out on both sides of the road, just like the uh, 6th U.S. Cavalry is, and begin to advance. Some of the 7th Virginia Cavalry that wasn't too uh, disrupted by the original charge, they participated as well. And a third regiment, the 11th Virginia Cavalry, they decided this looked like something they should get involved with as well. So elements of three regiments now are moving forward toward uh, Major Starr and his 350 so men on the high ground in front of us. Major Starr has a decision to make again. I, there's way more Confederates coming at me than I have right here. Should I stay or should I go? Uh, smarts say go, but Starr says stay. And in fact, not just stay, but mount a counterattack and, and go right at him. He's getting ready to order his men forward. Some of the mounted men are gonna move forward, but these Confederates are coming with a vengeance right now. They want payback for the way they've just been abused, the way their men were shot down in the road, and they attack with great vengeance and great vigor. And when they, when they attack this time, the combination of the horse artillery fire and the charging uh, cavalrymen are going to just blow Star's line. They begin to fall back. The fighting will for a while become hand to hand. Major Star is gonna get a saber cut across the head and he's gonna take a bullet through the arm. That arm is gonna to have to be amputated and Star himself will become a prisoner of the Confederates. Uh, several of his men, at least uh, nine of them will be killed or mortally wounded. One of them, was a, a bugler who had enlisted from Ohio at the age of 16, just the year before. He listed himself as a confectioner when he, uh, when he enlisted. Um, another one of those who was mortally wounded was Lieutenant Christian Balder, the Lieutenant who had sent uh, Star down this road to begin with. Well, the Confederates are, or the Union forces are pulling back. The Confederates are mounted. They're scooping up, especially the uh, dismounted troopers in, in great quantities. When this fight is over, about 242 of uh, Major Starr's men will be prisoners, or will be killed, wounded, captured, or pr prisoners, or, or simply missing in action. That's about a 60% casualty rate. And when they run, they are running and they are scattered, and the 6th United States Cavalry has become a non-factor in this, in this military action. Another visitor. Grumble Jones's men are gonna to continue to push the Confederates for, are gonna to continue to move forward. And they're going to push the remnants of the Union forces back into Fairfield and beyond Fairfield. And we wish we knew more about this last part, but somehow uh, 
lieutenants and captains are going to find little clusters of men and somehow reconstitute themselves as a unit and ultimately get back and, and be able to rejoin Merritt's brigade. But they're going to have all kinds of stories to tell about how chaotic this was. Uh, it's not a big fight when, when they start to count up casualties. In all, Grumble Jones lost about 50 men. The numbers are very sketchy. The, the low number is 38, the high number is 58. Take your pick. Uh, but what becomes very obvious is that the 6th United States Cavalry has suffered 242 casualties. If you're looking for wins or losses, this is a Confederate victory. We take a look at the Battle of Gettysburg and say Confederate defeat. But the fight back here, which probably lasted maybe a half an hour total, uh, ends up being really important in its own way. By securing this road and the town in the road to Fairfield, uh, Grumble Jones's men are go going to be able to secure the control of the Fairfield Gap. When Lee will begin to move his men back, he will not only have the use of the Cashtown Gap, they'll have control of the Fairfield Gap and the Monterey Gap beyond that. So Grumble Jones's men have earned their paychecks this day and they've done it in fine style. When we take a look at these individuals at, 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 and see what goes on with them, we know what happens to Grumble Jones in 1864 in early June. Uh, he will be killed in action at the Battle of Piedmont in Virginia. Starr himself will stay in the Army. He will not be chastised for what he did here. He also will not win promotion and any time soon for what he did here, but he will stay in the Army. And if you take a look at his biography, it, not include, it includes not only Mexican War service and Civil War service, but service out west against various Native American tribes as well. Uh, of the other, t t well, there's two other people whose stories are kind of cool. One of them is, well, one of them is kind of sad. That's Christian Balder. Balder was mortally wounded in the fight that he helped start, and he uh, would die of his injuries a few days later. Next time you come here to Gettysburg and go to Soldiers National Cemetery, go to the United States Regulars uh, sec section of the, of the uh, cemetery, and you can find Lieutenant Balder's grave. Lieutenant Balder was a, an immigrant from Prussia. He had enlisted in the United States Army back in 1855 as a private, and he had earned his way up through the ranks to become a commissioned officer. He was cut from the same material as Starr, apparently. He was hard, hard on discipline, tough on his men. They didn't love him, but they certainly seemed to respect him, and uh, they missed his leadership when it was gone. But one of the interesting things is if you come down here and find this battlefield, and you got to watch out for the traffic, as you've noticed during the interview. But uh, if you travel, if you just drive through uh, Fairfield a little bit, take take a look off the main road, going you know, it's Main Street in Fairfield. Take a look at the roads heading off to the north, and you're going to find one called Balder Street. And you'll wonder why you might you might not even think about it more than once or twice, but it all comes back to Lieutenant Balder and the Prussian immigrant sacrifice on this battlefield. The other lieutenant I just want to mention was a young man by the name of Adna Chaffee. Now, Adna Chaffee had enlisted in the United States Army uh, back in 1861 as a private. Uh, apparently, he showed a lot of smarts and apparently a lot of natural leadership talent because he was promoted to sergeant, and in May of 1863, he was promoted to second lieutenant. Uh, Brandy Station and this fight here were two of his first battles as an officer. Uh, Chaffee will be wounded here, and he will be treated in the same uh, house in town as, as Lieutenant Balder was. But unlike uh, Balder, Chaffee will survive. Not only will he survive, he will thrive. By He will get involved in um, the Philippines, in the Boxer Rebellion. He will rise to the rank of Lieutenant General, and between the years of 1904 and 1906, Lieutenant Adna Chaffee of the 6th U.S. Cavalry here at Fairfield will be Chief of Staff of the entire United States Army. His son, Adna Chaffee Jr., will be, be one of the fa fathers of the American uh, Armored Force. My dad was a tanker in World War II. He would look at this ground and say, good tank country. Well, I, I think he'd appreciate me giving a shout out to the Armored uh, armored forces t today as we're visiting here. Uh, Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, for some of you who might remember it, is named for Adna Chaffee. So from small skirmishes, very big results might, uh, might come as a consequence. And that was certainly the situation here at Fairfield. 
And of course, a lot of the little stories would go from there. One final comment. This is not the last time that, this is not the last time that the 6th United States Cavalry and Grumble Jones's men will run into each other. They'll face each other again during this retreat uh, in the Battle of Funkstown down in Maryland. And again, it will not go well for the 6th United States Cavalry or what's left of them. In his after action report, Grumble Jones wrote one line which ranks with me as one of the best lines to uh, ever be written in an after action report. He will say, the 6th United States Regular Cavalry is one of those units that is no more. And just period. He didn't have to explain anything. It belongs to the, those things that are no more. What a cool phrase. What a cool way of, of, of saying things. Um, a certain felicity of language that comes along with Grumble Jones here. But the bottom line is, even along a busy road here in farm country in, near Fairfield, Pennsylvania, in a little skirmish, big things resulted. I couldn't have said it better myself. Carol said she was going to push me off the camera as soon as she started to speak. She was absolutely right. I just stood back and let it happen. <laughs> She's fantastic. And if you ever see uh, Chappie's son, uh, who is one of the fathers of the United States uh, Armored Corps, you should see he's a tough, grizzled guy with a leather helmet on and everything from those days. So they're pretty, pretty tough guys out here. Uh, a couple of things I just want to mention. I don't have much to add. It's We have the Marshall House, which is actually a wartime structure. It's been added on to. There's a fantastic photograph we'll try to add into this video of the 6th U.S. Cav coming back here for a reunion after the war. And there is a monument on the front front, um, uh, on the front line. Just south of there is actually also a War Department tablet. Yes, you will find War Department tablets out here. That will be the Grumble Jones's Brigade. So if you're riding down towards Fairfield on the right-hand side of the road uh, from the Orcana of Cashtown area, you can see that War Department tablet. And we do have two Medal of Honor recipients that will um, receive the Medal of Honor for actions out here. One of them is George Platt. Uh, George is a Philadelphian who will come out here and save the colors of the 60 U.S. Cav as he comes out onto the field, probably over on that ridge line. Hand-to-hand -hand combat will ensue, and he will see the color bearer go down. He'll grab the flag, rip it from its staff, allegedly use the staff to impale a Confederate, stuff that, that color in his shirt, and then ride off the field to save it. And supposedly he kept that flag for the rest of his life. And for his actions in the 1890s, I believe 1895, he is a recipient of the Medal of Honor. And there's a bridge outside of Philadelphia that's named for him. So uh, that, that took place out here. Another thing I want to uh, point out, if you're into the mounted operations or if you're not into the mounted operations, take a look at what happens to the Union specifically cab during this campaign. We talk a lot about where's Jeb Stewart, where's Jeb Stewart. Take a look at what happens with the Union Cab and look what happens with the Union High Command overall. It's a constant reshuffling. You have a new Army commander, you have new Corps commanders, you have commanders who are killed in action. But right before the battle starts, we have three brand new Brigadier Generals, uh, Elon Farnsworth, Wesley Merritt, George Custer, Judson Kilpatrick becomes a division commander. Um, and we'll talk a lot about him. So you're going to see a lot of the reshuffling. And that 6th U.S. Cav is the only uh, regular army unit, cav unit, to be formed during the Civil War, and it is still an active unit today in the United States Army. It's fought uh, on San Juan Heights uh, during the Spanish-American War. It fought in, in Pershing's, uh, John Pershing's expeditionary force during the First World War, the Normandy and Ardennes Offensive in World War II, and beyond up to Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, so there, there are active units that fought at Gettysburg and are still fighting for America today. So take a look at the at their unit lineage. So if you ever get a chance to come out to Fairfield, it's a great little town to, to explore. And you can make your way out to where we're heading off to next, to Monterey, and explore more about one of the greatest logistical feats of the Civil War. And that is Robert E. Lee's withdrawal from Gettysburg back into Virginia. And it's a story you're not gonna wanna miss. So for the American Battlefield Trust, I wanna thank Carol Reardon. I wanna thank Gary Edelman behind the camera. I'm Chris White. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation. And speaking of Battlefield Preservation, the American Battlefield Trust has preserved more than 100 acres of the Fairfield Battlefield, I think off in this direction there, uh, in 2003, uh, along with the Land Conservancy of Adams County.